Councillor Katz for your gracious introduction. Um, I want to talk about Pirkei Avot, and I know that a lot of us know Pirkei Avot or think we know Pirkei Avot or have studied Pirkei Avot. Somebody uh, before Ari gave his warning quickly texted that they had just finished studying Pirkei Avot. And um, I, I find it is a extraordinary tractate of Mishnah. And it's extraordinary for many reasons, some of which I'm going to lay out now, um, not the least of which is the Mishnah is one of the key documents of rabbinic Judaism. There would really be no rabbinic Judaism without the Mishnah. The Mishnah was edited orally, by the way, um, around the year 200 of the Common Era. So 1800 years ago, it was edited by Yehuda Hanasi, who was fourth or fifth generation leader of the Jewish community in his family's dynasty. We'll call them the Gamlielites after the elder elder um, uh, in his family. Um, the Gamlielites, when I say Gamliel is the first in that um, dynasty, Gamliel is actually mentioned in the New Testament. Paul says he studied at the feet of Gamliel. He is defined there as a Pharisee. So I want to do a little bit of history before we turn to the text. So you can get background not only on the rabbis, but also on the philosophers. My case that I'm going to make tonight is that the rabbis consciously present themselves as a philosophical school. And if they are aligned with any school in the pagan world, in the Greco-Roman world, um, it would be the Stoics. I, I also want to say in full disclosure I'm not the first person who has suggested that the rabbis are like the Stoics, a Jewish historian who wrote in the first century of the Common Era, following the war against Rome. His name was Flavius Josephus. Josephus himself compared the Pharisaic and rabbinic movement to the Stoics. And tonight I'm going to try and make a little bit of a case why I think the rabbis were so much like the Stoics. So I want to set the scene for us because basically the text we're going to be studying tonight was composed somewhere between the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome in the year 70 of the Common Era, right? The second temple was burnt. Um, not so long ago, we had Tisha B'Av. That's when we commemorated it. And let's say we'll go up to about 100, 150 at the most, um, all the while realizing that I'm going to be teaching a text that's found in the Mishnah. The rabbis only emerged as a group after the destruction of the temple. As long as there was a temple in Jerusalem, that is to say, up to the year 70, power was jealously held by two centers. One was a secular center, if you will. The Jews had a king. And we had kingship. I mean, kingship goes all the way back to the Bible. It's not going to be a surprise to anyone if I say King David or King Solomon. And if I say David and Solomon, you also know that kingship was dynastic. It meant that you were a king because your father was the king before you. And as long as you could hold on to power, your son could be the king after you. The other center of power was a religious center of power, and it took place in the temple itself who offered the sacrifices, who basically ran Israelite cultic religion. They were the priests, the Kohanim. Um, I'm not going to tell the joke, but I will tell the punchline um, about a guy who comes to his rabbi and wants to says to the rabbi, Rabbi, I want to be a Kohen. And after a great deal of back and forth and back and forth and ultimately bribing the rabbi with a huge contribution, the rabbi finally says to him, why do you want to be a Kohen so much? And the guy says, well, you know, my father was a Kohen. My grandfather was a Kohen. Um, not quite getting that this too is a dynasty. But appreciate what happened in 70. When the temple came down at the hands of Rome, everything was up for grabs. We didn't need to have a dynasty any longer. And since we didn't have a temple, and it was clear that Jerusalem would not be quickly replaced and the temple would not be quickly rebuilt, the rabbis emerged as leaders in the community. To be a rabbi meant to be a teacher. And for teachers to suddenly be the force in the community, to preserve the community, was an unusual thing. 
Um, it had existed in the Hellenistic world because teachers, often calling themselves lovers of wisdom, philosophers, philosophers held a very, very strong brief in the Greco-Roman world. If we go back to, let's say, 300 before the Common Era, three, well, no, let me, give me another century, 400. 400 before the Common Era, there was a very famous teacher named Plato, right? He lived in Athens, he taught, he had disciples. One of his disciples was a guy named Aristotle. So we have Plato and Socrates, they, they would uh, disagree with each other, they would um, engage in, what do they call it? Um, well, if it were Talmud, we'd call it uh, argumentation. But since it was Plato and Socrates, we call it Platonic dialogue. One of my students actually wrote a wonderful book comparing the rabbi's argumentation with that of Plato and Socrates. But the next generation, Plato and Socrates had a student named Aristotle. And to show you Aristotle's influence, Aristotle was the tutor for a young boy named Alexander, who as he grew up became known as Alexander the Great. So Alexander, who basically conquered the entire civilized world and gave us Greco-Roman civilization, he wasn't just a general. He was very well educated, and he had Aristotle as his tutor. So on one side, there is the dynastic desire. Um, in Rome, the emperors, one after another, tried desperately to make sure their son would rule after them. So on one side is dynasty, and on the other side, I don't know, let's call it democracy, meritocracy. And in the rabbinic world, between the year 70 and let's say 110, in those first 40 years, incredibly important years, because they're trying to replace the temple, and they're trying to keep Judaism alive. One of my colleagues, Seth Schwartz at Columbia University, wrote a very influential book in which he argues that it was entirely possible in the 100 years after the destruction of Jerusalem that Judaism might have died out entirely. That it survived was a little bit by chance and a little bit by the zeal of the rabbis and others. But on one side, you have this dynasty, Gamliel, Gamliel's son Shimon, Shimon son Gamliel, Gamliel, the second Gamliel's son, is also named Shimon. Apparently, they were not very creative when it came to naming their children, but it helps keep track. So there's Gamliel one, Gamliel two, Shimon one, Shimon two, etc. That's on one side. And on the other side, there is a very influential rabbi named Yochanan ben Zakkai. And Yochanan and his disciples, none of whom are his children, um, essentially become the leading rabbis of the generation. And ultimately, they wind up splitting power so that the dynasty persists and the Gamliel-like family is kind of the secular head of the Jewish community. And the rabbis are rabbis as they are to this very day, um, in theory, by merit. I, I, I always pause there because in my many years at JTS, I can tell you that I have taught rabbis and then I've taught their children. And that I know rabbis who are the sons of rabbis who are the grandsons of rabbis. So there is a little bit of that dynasty going on. But essentially, it's what you learn. Around the year 300 BCE, one of the great philosophers, a disciple in a way of Aristotle's disciples, was a man named Zeno. Zeno taught his students while walking among the columns in Athens. Those columns, those very tall columns, are called to this day Stoa. And first, Zeno's students were called the Zeno guys. But later, they got to get the name the Stoics. And Zeno's philosophy became incredibly influential throughout the Roman, first the Greek and then the Roman Empire. Zeno was a get-along kind of guy. He believed that you should try and minimize suffering. So when my daughter, who's now about to turn 40, when my daughter was an infant and she got an ear infection, it often took us a couple of days to know it because she didn't cry like you might expect her to with an ear infection. And when we took her finally to the pediatrician, the pediatrician said, oh, 
your daughter is a stoic. And I thought she was kidding because she knew that I taught. But it turns out that that is a state, uh, that is a, a, an, a name, a title of, of pediatric art as well, that kids who don't complain are stoic. So if you get along, if you can endure suffering, that is one of the real keys of the Stoics. The other thing about the Stoics is that the Stoics genuinely believe in, I'm saying this in the plural, the gods. And they actually believe that the gods care what you do. Not only do they care what you do, they will judge you for it. Now, this should sound kind of rabbinic to all of us. Rabbis believe God cares what you do. God actually gives us mitzvot. And as Ari said, we're uh, just a few weeks away from Rosh Hashanah. And therefore, we expect that God will judge us for our deeds and that we will need to repent if we have not had a good year. Um, I I'm going to just for a moment move away from the Stoics because the Stoics had another group of philosophers who were very close to them. They were very close to them because they knew there were gods. They knew people could be judged. But the other group said that the gods really don't care what you do. They don't give a damn. And they're not going to punish you. But this other group said, all things being equal, ah, you may as well do good. Because doing good, doing evil, it's all the same. And that group was named after its teacher, Epicurus. And they are the Epicureans. So on one side, you have the Stoics. On the other side, you have the Epicureans. I'm setting us up so that now when we start looking at Pirkei Avot, we will see that there's a lot going on below the surface of the text, that it's not just wisdom literature or the Boy Scout manual. What we're seeing is a battle, a propaganda battle, if you wish, between groups of rabbis who are presenting themselves as the authentic inheritors of Jewish leadership after the destruction of Jerusalem. I want to set the scene time-wise as well, because we're going to be hearing from rabbis who live, as I said, from 70, maybe a little later, all the way up to the Mishnah. So from 70 to 200. And in the Roman side of things, it's very important to realize that there were Roman emper em emperors, sorry, and one of the most famous, because he wrote many boring books, um, was a man named Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. Marcus Aurelius. The emperor Marcus Aurelius, um, you can, by the way, still buy his books on Amazon. Um, you have one there. Is that William Gottfried is holding up Marcus Aurelius? William, I have to ask, do you have trouble sleeping? Is that why you, why you read Marcus Aurelius? Um, I, I find him a surefire soporific. I read like three lines and I'm already falling asleep. But, um, but there's lots of as it were, good Torah in Marcus Aurelius. His family name is Antoninus. He's one of seven Antonine emperors. And in rabbinic literature, the rabbis tell stories about how the editor of the Mishnah, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Judah, the, the patriarch, that Rabbi Yehuda was buddies with Antoninus, that they chatted with each other, they spoke, they talked philosophy with one another. Um, I don't know whether any of that is true or it's rabbinic fantasy. Rabbis are very good at fantasizing. So on one extreme, you have the emperor of Rome who is a self-proclaimed Stoic. On the other side, um, let's say from the year 50 to 135, so again, right in that period, there was a slave, a slave by the name Epictetus. And Epictetus wrote a great deal of Stoic philosophy as well. And they are probably the two premier Stoics in the rabbinic era. On one side, the emperor Antoninus, on the other side, the slave Epictetus. Epictetus, by the way, um, was banished from Rome in the year 93. Um, the emperor got annoyed with philosophers and he banned philosophers from the city of Rome, which means that they understand that if you say the wrong thing in public, you can literally be thrown out of your own city, the city where you live. And that's something that we're going to see momentarily in Pirkei Avot. So, so far, I've been doing a lot of talking about background, 
But if we take a moment, let's look at that very first slide. Um, many of you know this Mishnah. It's a very famous Mishnah. It sounds a little bit like a sports announcer, um, like telling you where the hockey puck is going. But this is actually about Moses receiving the Torah. So um, I'm going to read it in Hebrew and then my English translation. Moshe kibel Torah misinai um sarah liyoshua. V'yoshua lezekenim, lezekenim, lenevim, venevim, asrua, l'anshe knesset ha'gadola. So Moses received, you'll see I put the word received in all caps, Torah from Sinai. Sinai presumably means God here. That Moses got the Torah from God. This might very well be referring to oral Torah, not the written Torah. We don't need a Mishnah to tell us that God gave the written Torah at Sinai. That's already there in the Torah. We read it. But to know that oral Torah, rabbinic interpretation, has the authority and the authenticity of Sinai, that we need to learn. So we are told explicitly that Moses was the first to receive that Torah from God at Sinai, and he transmitted it to Joshua. Joshua transmitted it to the elders. Um, it's a little bit of a question who these elders are. Both the Torah and the book of Joshua do mention elders. Um, and apparently you don't have to be an old man to be an elder. You have to be wise and savvy and politically astute. So Joshua gives the Torah to the elders. The elders give it to the prophets. And when I say prophets, we mean the guys generally who are the Haftorahs in the synagogue on Shabbat. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the 12 smaller prophets. So the prophets. And then the prophets give it to the men of the great assembly. I will tell you, after 50 years of studying Pirkei Avot, I can say with absolute assurance, we have no idea who these people were. They're kind of filling in a blank that there must have been some assembly, some Sanhedrin, if you will, although that's a Greek term. Um, there must have been some assembly that led the Jews. It must have been great because, hey, it was ours. So there are men of the great assembly. If we do the math, they probably lived around the year 300 BCE, which means they're contemporary with Zeno, the founder of the Stoics. Um, I, I also want to take a moment to point out what's not on this list. Astonishingly, Moses gets the Torah. He gives it to Joshua, Joshua to the elders, the elders to the prophets. There's no Kohanim mention. Now, you know, if you read the Torah and the book of Leviticus, Kohanim are leading the Jewish community. Moses's brother is a Kohen. And all of his generation thereafter, they're conveniently left out of this list. Never heard of them. Who else isn't on the list? There are no kings. So this list, I dare say, is promoting the notion of intellectual discourse of meritocracy and not dynasty. Neither of the dynastic institutions of the Jewish world are listed. So Moses gives it to the men of the great assembly, and then the men of the great assembly say three things. They say, Havu mitunim badin, be deliberate, be careful when you judge. Ha'amidu talmidim harbe, raise up many students. And my, my favorite one, Asu Siag La Torah, make a fence around the Torah. One of my teachers taught me that if you make a fence around the Torah, you'll have a safer Torah. At least somebody's laughing. Okay. Um, there too, though, there's a great deal of debate what that means about making a fence around the Torah. So for instance, if it's Shabbat, and I'm in my home, there's actually nothing that prohibits me from lifting up a pencil. I'm carrying on Shabbat in my home. That's permissible. But the rabbis prohibit touching a pencil on Shabbat because it might lead to my writing, and writing is forbidden on Shabbat. So that category is a fence around the Torah, according to some people. But one of my teachers, Judah Golden, who has written a great deal about Pirkei Avot um, and wrote a marvelous translation of Pirkei Avot, 
Judah Golden says he actually thinks the fence around the Torah is deciding where the punctuation goes, where there's a period, where there's a comma, when a sentence begins, when a paragraph begins, and then putting in the nikudot, the, the uh, markings that tell you the grammar. Because Golden says without the grammar, you have an insecure text. So putting a fence around the Torah means making the Torah text secure. As it happens, if we count the terms, kibail, masar, kibail, masar. Um, Ari, if you can go to the next Mishnah, you can see another kibail there. Um, Antigonus of Soho um, received, right? And now you'll keep your eye out as we go through these Mishnayot. From 1-1 one, one to 2-8, through Perkei Avot, there is a chain of tradition Master disciple, master disciple, master disciple, receiving, transmitting, receiving, transmitting. And it goes from Moses at Sinai to Hillel and Shammai. And Hillel and Shammai give the Torah, transmit the Torah to Yochanan ben Zakkai and his disciples. So what we're looking at is a chain of tradition that Yochanan and his disciples have put out there basically as propaganda. Why do we have the right to be the rabbis who lead the Jewish community? We are in an unbroken chain that goes back to Moses at Sinai. That chain has 14 links. So I want to stop and take a step back, and I'm going to give you the teaching of my teacher, may he rest in peace, Elias Bickerman. Bickerman, in an article he wrote in the Revue Biblique in 1952, um, Bickerman argued that this chain of tradition is very well known in the Greek and Roman philosophical schools. Virtually every new leader of the Stoic school, when you are the leader of the school, you are the scholarch. You can hear the word skull for school, arc, the head of. So the new scholarch would always trace his lineage, his intellectual lineage, not his genetic lineage, back to the founder of the school. So no matter when you lived, you would, in 14 links, somehow ingeniously connect yourself back to Zeno, founder of the Stoa. Or if you were an academic, you would trace yourself back to Aristotle. Or perhaps if you were a Neo Neoplatonist, you trace yourself back to Plato. For those of you that might know the New Testament, you know that the Gospel of Matthew begins with a dynastic lineage of Jesus that goes back all the way into the old, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And it does it by two lists of 28 generations, that is to say, two chains of 14. Bickerman did not know the reason why 14 is the magic number. I don't either. But I can tell you that Bickerman is spot on. When the rabbis offer a chain of tradition, and they say that they have authority going back to the founder of their school. In this case, the founder would be Moses at Sinai. And it, it's 14 links. Their listeners understand very clearly that they are presenting themselves as philosophers and at the head of a philosophical school. So keep your eye on Kibail and Masar. Now that we're on that second Mishnah, let's look and see what Antigonus of Soho had to say. Um, so first of all, I do want to point out that the name Antigonus is not Hebrew. I always feel a little bad. Here's a guy, he's in the chain of tradition in Perkei Avot. And I feel fairly certain that had he gone to Hebrew school with me, the Hebrew school teacher would have said to him, you know, We'll, we'll call you Avraham here. We're, we're going to give you a nice Jewish name. But obviously, Antigonos has this beautiful Hellenistic name. He's a very good Jew. He's in the chain of tradition. He comes from Soho. Um, New Yorkers all know where Soho is, right? It's south of Houston. Um, but apparently, that's, that's where Antigonus grew up. Um, in Israel, people guess that Soho is where there is currently an Arab village called Sachna. Um, when you could still go in and out of the West Bank, 
there, um, there are hot springs at Sachna. I actually once went as a kid. I went splashing around at Sachna. So maybe that's where Antigonus is from. But Antigonus has a very interesting thing that he has to say. And he's going to bring, unfortunately, to our attention the fact that the rabbis, like the Stoics, like everyone else, lived in a society where slavery was part of the norm. So earlier I mentioned Epictetus, a Roman slave. Um, the rabbis also could potentially have been slaves because if they were captured in the war from 66 to 70, or they were captured in the Bar Kokhba revolt from 132 to 135, they got sold on the slave market. Often Jews bought them. That's called redeeming captives. But that means that they were slaves. So Antigonus gives the following advice. He says, do not be like a slave who serves his master for the sake of getting pros. I didn't translate that word, pros. Rather, be like a slave who serves his master, not in order to receive pros. So the question is, what's pros? In modern Hebrew, pros is the same word as prize. And many Pirkei Avot translations will translate that term as prize, in which case Antigonus is saying it's better to be a volunteer. Don't serve your master in order to get a reward. Serve whether you get a reward or not. Along comes Elias Bickerman, again, my teacher Bickerman, who knows the Hellenistic world. When he was alive, he was the premier scholar of Hellenism. And Bickerman says, well, pras is actually a well-known Persian phenomenon out of the slavery world. Pras is the food ration that a slave gets. Now, in the Greco-Roman world, you were not required to give your slave food any more than you were required to give your cow food or your dog food. Now, if you had common sense, you'd feed them. You'd be protecting your investment. But you don't have to feed them. So the institution of pras arose in which a slave owner could say to a slave, I'm not feeding you. You work for me 12 hours a day and I'm a good guy. The other 12 hours, you're on your own. So you can earn your own food and you're responsible to feed yourself. Now, that's an amazing phenomenon. It meant that slaves could earn money and maybe buy themselves freedom. But it also meant that slaves could starve to death. So this is a much darker Mishnah, the way Bickerman reads it. Don't count on God to give you anything. God took you out of Egypt. God's, God's part of the bargain is done. You got to work for yourself. And while you're at it, the last thing he says, let the fear of heaven be upon you. Let's look at number three. Um, as we go through, at a certain point, there are sets of pairs. Um, the pairs are called in Hebrew zugot. Um, so uh, back one, Yossi ben Yoezer. Yeah, there we are. So here's a pair. Yossi, Ari. Okay, there we go. Yossi ben Yoezer, who is from the town of Tzreda, and Yossi ben Yochanan, who is from Yerushalayim. And again, you see key blue. They received tradition. So um, the pairs are called in Hebrew zugot. Again, it's actually not a Hebrew word. The term zug is borrowed from Greek. You probably know it in its Greek form because we've also borrowed it in English. We have a zygot, right, which is a cell that divides in two. So you have a zug, something that's a pair. And this pair um, received the tradition. Yossi ben Yoezer says, let your house be a gathering place for the sages. Sit in the dust at their feet. Drink thirstily their words. So these, he's basically describing peripatetic philosophers. With the exception of the Stoics, the philosophers did not have a bricks and mortar school. The philosophers went about their day. Their disciples thought of them as sages. Um, the word sage, chacham, um, I'm called a sage on my ordination certificate. It says I'm called rabbi 
rabbi, and I'm called chacham, which Spartan use. But the term sage is in Greek sophos, like a philosopher. So it's the same term. The rabbis adopt the term of the philosophers. They adopt the style of the philosophers, that the disciples will follow them around. Um, Somebody will open their home, perhaps, so that they can have a lesson in the home. And then finally, they should sit at the feet of the philosophers and drink up their words. Now let's go to the next one, Yossi ben Yochanan. Yossi ben Yochanan says, may your house be open wide and may the poor be members of your household. This is a phenomenon that Epictetus, the slave, repeats regularly in all of his writings, that the true good person is the one who cares for the poor. Now, in our Jewish world, we have a long established tradition of tzedakah. We take care of our poor. That was not the case in the Roman world. And the Stoics were offering something new when they suggested to the Roman world that you have an obligation to the poor. Every other group would say, who cares about the poor? Let them feed themselves or starve. So Epictetus is saying something new, and he is here accompanied by Yossi ben Yochanan of Jerusalem. Let's look at the next slide, number five. And this is classic, classic, classic. Um, Stoicism. Yehoshua ben Parachia Venitai Ha'ar Bailey. Um, I'm, I'm always interested in the names of these rabbis. Yehoshua, you all know, that's a good biblical name, Joshua. But Parachia is a, is a name, it literally means God's flower. And it's a name that probably is associated with Kohanim. And then there's Nitai, um, Again, a name not found in the Torah, in the Bible. And he's from the town of Arbel. Um, in, I'm trying to think what year it was, 1976, I lived in Jerusalem for the summer. And I got up very early every morning to Davin at the synagogue, just up, up the hill from me. And there was a guy in that synagogue named Arbel. So I, naive American, went to him in my halting Hebrew and I said, are you from the town of Arbel? You know, it's in Pirkei Avot. And he looks at me like an idiot. And he says, yeah, we've read Pirkei Avot. Thanks. Right? So, you know, for me, this was a big discovery that there are still people who are Arbeli. But um, Nitai received tradition. Again, you have the magic word. And he says, stay away from a bad neighbor. Don't cozy up to evil people. And this is the one I'm focused on. Do not despair there will be payment. That is to say, do not despair of punishment. How did I translate it? Yeah, punishment. But basically what he's saying is there will be reward for your good deeds and there will be punishment for your bad deeds. This is an essential Stoic doctrine. And it's what separates the Stoics from the Epicureans. The Epicureans, again, say, eat, drink, and be merry. God doesn't give a, the gods don't give a damn what you do. So, all right, all things being equal, you should be good. Whereas the Stoics are saying, no, the gods do care. The gods are showing you the way and you should do good as the gods command and they will reward you and punish you. Let's go to the next Mishnah, number six. That's slide number six. So here, Shmaya and Avtalion, they are the second to the last of the uh, Zugot, Shmai, a good biblical Hebrew name, Avtalion, a good Greek name. Avtalion translates into Greek, as it were. It's transliterated. Eutelos, the guy with a good ending. Um, either that means that his parents had longed for a child for many years, prayed to God, and finally had a, a baby, so he was called the good ending. It all came out good in the end. But it's also a name that's found in Greek quite regularly as, you know, my baby, he's a good boy. Um, in America, in our slave community, it was common to call slaves goody. And if you, you don't know about that, 
you should remember the Supreme Court Justice Thorogood Marshall, right? Thorogood Marshall was thoroughly good. And when he was a kid, his parents called him Goody. So he could be, in Hebrew, we'd call him Avtalion. Um, and he says, be careful what you say, sages, lest you incur banishment. So he's living a century before Epictetus, but he's painfully aware of the fact that if the emperors or the leaders of the community don't like what you have to say, they will banish you from your city. So the rabbis themselves have taken this up and they appreciate that rabbis can unfortunately teach things that will annoy the powers that be and they can indeed be exiled. Let's go to the next slide. After Shmaya and Avtalion, famously come Hillel and Shammai. So um, Shammai is a very, very famous rabbi. And it's so interesting that he has this partner, Hillel, who was named after the Jewish institution on college campuses. I think it's quite lovely. Um, he must have gone to an American university and been Jew a Jewish studies major. Um, later, probably by the year 300 of the Common Era, the Gamalielite family decides, oh, Hillel was our great-great-grandfather. There's no evidence of it within 300 years of Hillel's living, but later on they decided he would be a good relative to have. So Hillel is obviously very famous. If you know stories of Hillel and Shammai, you know that um, Shammai is often the curmudgeon in the stories. So I, I took this piece of Shammai, so you see what's probably the closest thing that we have to an actual statement of Shammai. Shammai says, I have to find my place, make your Torah fixed, that is to say, you should study regularly, say little and do much, generally good advice. And then the last thing, which is the kicker, greet everyone with a cheerful countenance. So this certainly isn't the Shammai that we meet in the famous stories of Hillel and Shammai and the would-be convert, where Shammai's beating people up. But this is probably the real Shammai. He was actually a nice person. So you should feel good about Shammai, not just Hillel. And then I skipped a little, a couple of lines. And um, Shimon, the son of, son of Gamaliel, says the following thing. So this is Shimon. This is Shimon, the son of the great Rabban Gamaliel. Um, he lives in the 90s of the first century. And he says, all my days I was raised among the sages. And I have found nothing better for myself than silence. This is a rabbi who has learned his lesson well. If you're in the academy and you have the great sages speaking, keep your mouth shut and listen. And that works out pretty good. Um, I like to remind my rabbinical students of this saying. Um, they often like to hear themselves whether they have anything to say or not. So it's good to have Pirkei Avot to quote at them. Um, now let's go to number eight. Um, and here... Actually, let me just back up one second about silence, um, because I have an Epictetus quote for you. Epictetus, the great Stoic slave, says, keep silent for the most part. Speak only when you must, and then briefly. So again, these guys could be quoting one another. It seems like it's common wisdom. But this is the common wisdom that was taught by a philosophical school and became the norm of the Roman Empire. And our rabbis are able to either initiate it themselves or learn it and, and repeat it. So now, um, I, I don't have it on the screen, but when we get to the next slide, Yochanan ben Zakkai and his disciples finally appear. The Mishnah tells us that Yochanan received the tradition from Hillel and Shammai. He had five disciples. He names the disciples. He gives them all sobriquet. He compliments them. And then he comes to them and he says to them, Amar lahem, tzu'u or u, ezo hi derech yishara 
Shidbak Bahadam. Some texts say Ezohi Derech Tova. So Yochanan Ben Sakai says to his disciples, go forth and see what is the straight path or the good path that a man should cling to. And after they each bring back their answer, he then says, What's the bad path that you should avoid? Um, I mentioned him earlier, my teacher, Judah Golden. Judah Golden says that these exact words are standard in every Stoic beginner's lesson. That when the, when the kids, as it were, first come to the Stoic Academy, that's roughly equivalent to um, freshmen in college, actually. They've been through the basic education, and then they come to the Stoic Academy. The very first thing the teacher instructs them is, go forth and learn what is agathon, what is the good way, and then what is kakon, the bad way. So Golden is delighted. Um, he wrote this, uh, a, an article in Traditio in 1965, in pointing out that Yohanan ben Zakkai is here mimicking, almost verbatim, standard Stoic educational practice. Now let's go to the next slide where I have, again, a couple of pieces of interesting Torah. Rabbi Elazar, who is one of Yochanan's students, says, Heve shakud lomo Torah. Be zealous, be diligent to learn Torah. And then the kicker, da mishatmasha tashiv La apikoros, know how to offer rebuttal to an apikoros. So some of you who are Yiddish speakers or even Hebrew speakers think that the word apikoros means a heretic. And indeed, in the Babylonian Talmud, 300 years after this, where they didn't know Greek, that's what they thought it meant. But in Tanaitic literature, in the earliest rabbinic literature, every time you see the term Epicurus, it means an Epicurus, somebody of the Epicurean school. So if the Stoics are the opponents of the Epicureans, here we have a great rabbi, Rabbi Elazar, saying you need to know, the thing you need to learn is how to rebut the arguments of the Epicureans. Finally, he says, he reiterates, basically, Stoic doctrine. How do you rebut the Epicurean? You rebut the Epicurean by telling them, know before whom you labor, and that the master of your labor will indeed pay the reward of your work. The Epicureans say there's no reward. There's no master. Or as we would say in Aramaic, late din late dayan. That's apicorsus. But um, if you know how to refute an Epicurean, you do it by quoting Stoic doctrine to them. And now that last slide of Pirkei Avot. And I, I quoted it only briefly. Ben Zoma, who is one of the great early rabbis, offered a series of paradoxes, a pair of paradoxes, a um, and he said the first one, Ezehu Chacham, who is the sage? Hello, made me call Adam. Not the one who teaches everyone, but the one who learns from everyone. And Ezehu Gibor, who is mighty? Not the person who can defeat everyone, but Hakoveshet Yitzro, the person who can control his libido conquers his desires. Ezehu Ashir, and who is the rich person? Hasameach Bechelko, the one who is happy with what he's got. Now, there is no more stoic sentiment than that last bit, but I want to just share with you. Epictetus says, wealth consists not in great possessions, but in having very few wants. He goes on to say, he is wise who does not grieve for things he does not have, but rejoices for what he has. And then finally, not Epictetus and not Marcus Aurelius, but a philosopher named Philostratus in his Vitae Sophistoi says that the prince is superior 
if he can control himself. Self-control was one of the great virtues of the Stoic philosophy. They call it sophrosune, self-control. And the idea of a Stoic was, I'm going to say it in Greek, and then I'll, I'll give you the English term, was apatheia. So in English, we say apathy. But apathy sounds negative. In Greek, apatheia means you don't get yourself all worked up. You, you calm your emotions. You don't get overwrought. Um, you have self-control, so for a sune. And these are the great Stoic virtues that our rabbis of blessed memory also share. So last week, I made a case from art that the rabbis were very comfortable in the world of art um, in the Roman world. And today, I began to make a case that the rabbis are comfortable in either quoting or mimicking the teachings of of the Stoics. In other words, not just any philosophers, we can name the philosophers, they are Stoics. So now, um, Ari, you're still here? Can we go to the chat? Is it, or the questions, I guess? Um, yeah, well, people actually did not um, chat much. And so now the chat is open. Hopefully you can chat questions. I will ask a few questions as we start based on what I have here. Um, Let's see. Um, is, is what you've taught us now is common? Is, is it commonly accepted about the rabbis and the Stoics, or is this? Well, one like... of the things I love when people ask me that question, like, "Are you just making this stuff up, or do other people agree with you?" Um, I, I was careful to quote some of my sources that I quoted my teacher Bickerman or Judah Golden, two of the great scholars. Um, in Bickerman's case, it's interesting. He was not a, a, Jew, a Jewish studies scholar. He was a Hellenistic scholar. He was in the faculty at Columbia University, and before that at the University of Paris, and before that the University of Berlin. So Bickerman, as a Hellenist scholar, couldn't help but notice when he first, as an adult, came to read Perkei Avot, he said, this is all Stoic. Golden was a JTS grad, a rabbi, a professor at Yale and then the University of Pennsylvania, and he took uh, Bickerman's work and took it further as well. In um, Aphrodite, I give more examples beyond that of my teachers because I wanted to extend their, um, their purview on the issue of philosophy, that the rabbis were comfortable in the philosophical world, but primarily as Stoics. Shirley Frank writes, she took a course with Bickerman in 64, and um, I don't know what, he, what it must have been like to be a woman in his class. He was quite um, earthy, if you will, um, but uh, I studied with him in probably somewhere in the mid-70s when he was already in his 80s, so uh, I, I count it a great privilege to have studied with him. In the Pirkei Avot, you read us when you read the, the people and their quotes, no one was referred to as a rabbi or even an elder or anything. There were no terms used in Pirkei Avot for any teacher from Hillel up. So let me start with the early ones. Hillel is not actually a rabbi. He is Hillel Hazakain. He is an elder, as is Shammai. Shammai is called an elder, as is the first Gamliel, an elder. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, Rabbi Elazar, all of the ones after the Zugot, from Yochanan onward, are all titled rabbi, and they do have that title. In your book, you talk about the origin of the word rabbi. Can you share that with the group? Yes. So thank you for asking. In the Torah and in the Bible, the word rav, rabbi, means master. So, you know, it's like you have a disciple, they have a master. But the truth is, more often than not, it's the master of a slave. I try and remind my students that, that they're my slaves, but they're not buying it. Um, or um, in the book of Jonah, you'll hear it on Yom Kippur, the guy who is the uh, guy who's running the ship, the captain of the ship, he's called Rav HaChovel. It's only after 70 that the term rabbi comes to mean teacher. And the earliest work that uses it retrojects it back to a guy who lived in, in the 30s of the first century. So the, this is a great irony of history. The earliest person we know with the title rabbi is Jesus of Nazareth. 
his disciples in the Gospels call him Rabbi. And then, since it's a Hebrew term, they translate it into Greek, didaskalos, teacher. Um, after Jesus, then it became a much more regular term post-70. And Yochanan and Zakkai and his students, and all the way up till today, we call our leaders, our teachers, our masters, Rabbi. But as I said earlier, we also use the term Chacham, sage, which is the equivalent of sophist, sophoi, like a philosopher. Um, Lisa and Paul and other people ask, so if, if what you're saying is correct and what your teachers are saying correct, that the rabbis are following in this, in this literature Stoic philosophy or, or espousing Stoic philosophy, how did the rabbis come to learn all this? How, you know, how did they, you know, where did they pick it all up from? They are out and about. I mean, if I told you that uh, in the 1960s and 70s and even the 1950s that there were rabbis who were espousing the Protestant work ethic, um, you'd all get it because that's the natural ethos of the country. That's what everybody's talking about. And I think Stoicism was that for the Roman Empire. But more so, we have evidence that rabbis, great rabbis, sent their children to study with these philosophers. One of the great um, teachers of rhetoric, Libanius in Antioch in the fourth century, the patriarch of the Jewish community sent his kid up to Antioch to study with Libanius. Um, as it were, the rabbis then, like the rabbis now, aspire to send their kids to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, University of San Diego, etc. cetera. Um. Do we, do we know what the word Rabbi actually means? It means my master. Okay. Well, as you said, we'll, we'll all think of that every time we go to Shul from now on. Although it does tie into like Zen master, right? Yes. And the, the person who teaches you the way to be in the world is your master. That's what you call them. You brought up Jesus and so did someone else here because Jesus comes into every program that we do, I guess. Came into Danny Matt, talked about Jesus last week. Um, can you, does Jesus espouse Stoic philosophy? Huh, that's a good question. And, and I, I confess I have not thought about it that way. Um, Jesus is a complicated character, not least of which because we have four different accounts of his life and teaching. And, and, they, and they are not all coherent. Um, I would say in general, he could be within the broad purview of Stoicism, but he generally did not, present himself as much of as a philosopher as kind of a um peacenik if you will but um, he was, but, he was a, a, i mean according to the traditions he was a master with students he had disciples that is true um I, I, and and indeed he had 12 disciples so um i i i, I really can't give you an adequate answer ari it's okay. We have one more program. You can like, you know, we'll get an answer next week. I, I will promise you that I'm not going to spend time worrying about Jesus and his stoic philosophy. <laughs> okay. Um, Paul asked the question. He, he, he asked the question I, I already brought up, which was how, do, did the, how did the rabbis become familiar with Greek philosophy? But then he asked a question, which I will maybe say in a different word. He asked, do the rabbis know Greek? And you showed that there are Greek names um, and there are obviously Greek words. Are there a lot of, is there a lot of Greek words in the Mishnah, for example? So let's take rabbinic literature as a whole. Mishnah, Tosefta, the Talmud. There are between three and 4,000 loan words from Greek. It's like going to Israel today and you, you, you hear all these borrowed words from English or now from Russian. Um, the hegemon, um, Greek word, uh, the, the hegemony of the, the Greek language was very powerful. Um, there was a synagogue in Tveria that recited the Shema in Greek. Now, that's a passage from the Torah, which might make us wonder whether their Torah was Greek as well. Um, like, you got to be a real Greek-speaking shul. When we look at... Um, Inscriptions in synagogues from the first through the seventh century, more than 50% of them are in Greek. 
So um, most of the rabbis must have had a, a minimal, a little Greek. And some of them, we know for a fact, were fluent in Greek. Is there a particular rabbi in this period that you would say is the most Greek? I mentioned earlier Gamliel. Gamliel is quoted as saying, in my father's house, meaning the school his father sponsored, there were 1,000 students. 500 of them learned Torah, and 500 of them learned, he says, Chochmat Yevanit, Greek wisdom. So um, there, there were a lot of rabbis who were very comfortable. Um, I can think of another Palestinian rabbi, Rabbi Abahu, who actually can make puns, bilingual puns from Hebrew to Greek. So if you, if you can do that, your Greek's pretty good. Susan asked a question that I'm going to rephrase a bit, which is, um, what about the rest of Pirkei Avot? What's in there? You've showed us some of Pirkei Avot. There's a lot more in there. Is it continue to be stoic type philosophy or is it different? So it, it's a lot of different things because it covers a lot of generations. Um, I would say on the whole, Pirkei Avot is fairly comfortable within the broad purview of Stoicism. I chose what I chose because we had exact parallels from Epictetus or from other philosophers. Thank you. We are now done with the session. Can you give us a preview for next week? Where when you when Oh, we golly, yes. Together, what are we going to learn? So I mentioned the Mishnah today as the, the core um, document of rabbinic Judaism. We're going to read a Mishnah next week in which a pagan asks Gamliel, why is it that he can be in a bathhouse with a statue of Aphrodite? And I'll give it away. Gamaliel's basic answer is, is just, well, sometimes art is just art. If you're not worshiping it, then it's permissible. And mind you, from the time of Gamaliel onward, we start seeing pictorial art in the Jewish community. Before that, not so much. So um, Gamaliel may have offered a new way, but clearly... Uh, they are concerned, and that the, the statue of Aphrodite, of all things, was the trigger for it. Um, then we're going to read another long story, which um, is a little bit like a, a student's joke. It's about a rabbinical student who saves up his money and goes to a very expensive, fancy prostitute. And what happens? And I'll wait until next week so you, you have something to look forward to between the, the Reb student and the hooker. Sounds like a good thing to read right before Rosh Hashanah. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you for joining us for part two of our series with uh, Professor Vazansky. Uh, David Wilner is very excited, I can see, for next week's study session. So if you have something to send him in advance, he is a very high-level patron. We can give him, if you have pictures, he wants to know as well. I don't know. If you have anything, but just a picture of Aphrodite. He'll There's take a lot that. of those. He'll take that. David will take that. Oh, Fred, don't look at that. It's for David. Okay. So with that, everybody, it's good to see Louis Sherby and uh, the, I see Joe Ruder. I can see you there with Mark Berman's mother. It's very nice to see you guys, Bonnie, as well. And um, have a great and safe rest of your Sunday. If you're on the East Coast, it's time to go to bed. If you're on the West Coast, it's time for dinner. I'm going home to have dinner with my children. And uh, Neil, it's definitely your bedtime. Although you seem very much awake. Neil's going out tonight. Wear your mask at the, at the clubs, please, Neil. Okay. Leone, good to see you. And Susan Edelman, always nice to have you with us. Howard Merritt's had this very long philosophical thing that I will cut and paste and send to you, Professor Vazadsky. Please. So enjoy at your leisure between now and next week. And I'll send you Howard's email. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Chuck. Have good a good week. You. Bye, Ingrid. Bye, everybody. Take care. Be good. Bye, Joanne.